Hello, Void and All Who Inhabit It. It's me, and I'm tired. So I had a whole script written about vampire movies in preparation for Halloween. We see how that went. But in that process, I watched Black as Night, a newish Amazon Prime movie about a teenage girl, Shauna, who becomes a vampire hunter in order to avenge her mother's death. Black as Night is not good. I read a couple reviews to see if I was bugging, and interestingly enough, a couple of people describe the movie as a black exploitation film. I realize that almost any low budget black movie that tries to touch on current events or social issues gets labeled as black exploitation because of its budget, to the point where the label has become a misnomer. But I felt like there's something else underlying what makes people label these movies as black exploitation, even if they don't necessarily feel like the same movies from the 70s. My research for the aforementioned abandoned script also led me to watch Blackula, and with the comparison of a genuine black exploitation film in mind, I started to wonder what is it that distinguishes something like Black as Night from something like Blackula? Or another way of asking this, what does black exploitation look like in 2021? There's been several modern callbacks to black exploitation movies, both real and parody. But I want to focus on this recent wave of films and shows that approach current social issues with a similar fervor as the 70s hits, the nouveau black exploitation. They're higher budget for sure, well, some of them, but aren't they also creating a fast profit by referring to cultural contemporary anxieties? There's an ever-present layer to films about Black people-specific topics not being taken seriously or primarily being viewed through their moments of levity. Aishayo, who has much better time management skills than I, focused her Halloween video on Tales from the Hood and its sequels. Something that was interesting to learn through her video was that Tales from the Hood was marketed as a horror comedy when it was released. Aishayo pulled an interview with Rusty Kundif, the director and co-writer, where he criticizes the decisions of the executives more interested in how to sell the film than the actual content. Another more recent example is Get Out being nominated for a Golden Globe in comedy when it was released. Now, you could apply the lens of horror and comedy being closely related, with both genres relying on tension and relief for storytelling when looking at either of those films. But black exploitation as a label invokes more than the use of a shared storytelling device. So what is it about these films that causes them to be labeled as black exploitation if it's not solely the budget and it's not a specific storytelling device such as tension and relief? An exploitation film is a film that's designed to create a fast profit by referring to or exploiting contemporary cultural anxieties, often via niche genres or including lurid content. Exploitation films also are genuinely low budget. Fun fact, a lot of horror films, specifically slashers, can be considered exploitation films as well due to their formula. Black exploitation films are then exploitation films that focus on content about and for black audiences, specifically urban black audiences. This genre brought us such gems as Shaft, Foxy Brown, and Blackula. Beyond the explicit 70ness of the wardrobe, music, and vocabulary choices that make black exploitations easily identifiable, there are a few shared themes. For ease, we'll only be focusing on three major ones. First, there is the zeitgeist that 70s black exploitation movies were exploiting, the Black Panther Party and the idea of black revolutionaries in general. As a result, a lot of these old stories focus on black resistance and empowerment, with a focus on urban populations fighting against inner city injustice and hardships, typically around drugs, plays a center role in many of these stories as well. Secondly, the in-narrative empowerment 
is gained through overcoming the man or facing off against the white establishment, often via a very blatant signifier, like an evil white man cackling in a wing back chair while someone is chained to his desk type of blatant. Finally, the black protagonist often has some power. If they're not a cop or a veteran or a private eye, they've got some skill, usually very good aim, that's necessary for their success. Let's look again at Black as Night. Black as Night focuses on the growing impact of gentrification, specifically throughout a post-Katrina New Orleans that's only becoming more segregated. It's an urban setting, so of course there's discussion about drug addiction. The main character having a relative struggling with drug addiction who dies early in the plot, with said death motivating said main character is also very familiar. There is also a minor plot line about colorism that rivals bad hair in terms of lazy opportunism. Third in this section is the film's overall heavy handedness with buzzwords, which itself feels like a very post 2016 media thing to do, so I'm counting it here. Bonus points for most of this vocab dump coming via the gratuitous gay best friend character who, before dying at the end, serves as an all-knowing tour guide of sorts. An interesting aspect of nouveau black exploitation is the frequency at which the big bad is another black person. The social commentary in these films often includes a condemnation or critique of the actions of black people within the narrative who are roughly fighting for the same thing but woke up and chose violence instead. The villain of Black as Night presents a great example of this trend with the character Babino, Initially perceived as an overzealous street preacher protesting against the destruction of a housing project, Babineau is later revealed to be the leader of the evil vampires turning homeless people, including Shauna's mother. In a story told by Tunde, an 800-year-old good vampire, we learn that Babineau is a former slave who murdered the man who owned him after he was turned. Mind you, Babineau is also framed as the big bad who must be defeated because his plan to prevent gentrification. He's also described as viewing humans as no more than cattle. It's a lot and also not enough. If Black as Night was a 70s film, Babino would have been the developer trying to gentrify the neighborhood, not a frustrated citizen trying to stop it. Another example from another recent film, William and Candyman 2, would have been the art curator who was f***ing his intern, or maybe a fan of Helen's who was obsessed with the story, not a resident of Cabrini Green. I have a whole video talking about that movie, but the choice to make William the antagonist and his goal in general are set up as a way to make commentary very blatantly, which also makes them, in my opinion, narratively weak choices because the point is to teach the viewer a lesson, to leave them with a message, instead of to make a compelling story that has compelling commentary embedded within it. I think there is definitely a space to challenge the ways marginalized people internalize systems of oppression and weaponize them against other marginalized people. But that is not the same as outwardly condemning marginalized people who choose more radical paths which is often what the underlying messaging is for these stories. In Candyman 2 specifically, a lot of this is also paired with that scene of the cops being murdered in the end that feels very performative. Which brings me to another major trait of nouveau black exploitation antagonists. They are no longer explicitly whiteness. I think this is in part due to money, making stories that appear to challenge the status quo but aren't that threatening means more people will watch said story and more money will be made, which remember is a key goal of exploitation films. But from a narrative view, these movies don't point to a source of oppression as neatly as 70s black exploitation films that would often directly attack this idea of Mr. Charlie. Get Out is the closest modern example of a willingness to point explicitly to whiteness and the behaviors white people perform to maintain that status as an issue. No sympathetic backstory, no pedantic info dump, just sh** ass behavior but amplified. Black as Night 
and a lot of new movies and shows choose instead to say that the issue isn't why the marginalized antagonists wanted to act, but how they behaved. That angle splits hairs over semantics instead of addressing the actual root of a lot of these issues folks say they want to tackle. This is also a great place to compare nouveau black exploitation to a film like Blackula, given the titular character as the antagonist. Blackula's goal is to reconnect with his his wife, who has been reincarnated and like doesn't remember their life. He does things which impact the people around him, namely eating them, but he's not trying to do this like big societal shifting thing. He just wants to get his wife back and go live a blissful black vampiric existence. Who the f knows where? That's different from Babineau, who wants to stop gentrification in New Orleans by making a vampire army, starting with houseless people because he feels they will quote unquote will not be missed those are two goals of very different magnitudes so even when looking at black exploitation villains that aren't directly connected to whiteness we see that in this very small sample size admittedly they don't have these huge societal shifting goals the way that somebody like babineau or arguably william or somebody like Carly, now I'm not going to remember her last name either. I'm recording this bit again on Thanksgiving. Hey y'all, happy all you can eat day. Focus. My point here is that even when we had antagonists who were not white people, their goals were not so diabolical as what we are being presented now. Interestingly enough, all of this, the idea of how do you make this person the villain if they are another black person, how do you present their goal as maybe reasonable, but their their methods as unreasonable and unjust also connects to the next major theme. So we've got the time and we've got the antagonist, but what's special about the protagonist that will help her win? Well, nothing really. In Blackula, it is important that Dr. Thomas, who is the dude trying to prevent Mama Walde, brief Google search reminded me, Dr. Thomas is trying to prevent Mama Walde from continuing to eat people. And it is important that Dr. Thomas is a doctor because that's how he figures out that all this stuff is going on, right? But in Black as Night, Shauna is just a teenager who has this trauma. The closest they get is that Shauna is dark skin and throughout the film, kinda, we are shown that she is self-conscious about that. Towards the end, both Tunde, the good vampire, and Babineau, the bad vampire, tell her that having dark skin is valuable as a vampire. Melanin makes it possible for them to become daywalkers faster and one of them mentions that it also makes them more powerful. But Shauna's not trying to become Blade. She hates vampires intensely. And the final confrontation takes place at night. So like, there's not even a roundabout connection here. Speed running colorism commentary aside, Shauna's skin tone is a trait we are told has important function within the plot, but it doesn't actually impact what happens. Candyman 2 does this also with Anthony being the Cabrini green baby. That high key does not matter for the story, especially in comparison to Helen being the reincarnation of Robotai's lover and the importance that has for her story. Here, we also see the difference in telling the audience that something is important versus showing the audience how that trait impacts the character's story. Bad Hair is another example of a film trying the latter by showing us Anna's scar, but the impact her trauma around hair has on behaviors doesn't go much further than showing us that Anna is tender-headed. So it sounds like then these main characters don't have any ultra-heroic traits, and perhaps that's a way of making them and their stories a bit more relatable. But I think these protagonists actually do have a secret power, the greatest one of all, respectability. Going back to the antagonists of nouveau black exploitation films more often being other black people who are too far out there, 
What makes the protagonist the hero of the story is their buy into respectability politics. Black as Night is an easy example. At the end of the film, Shauna picks up where we first saw Babineau, asking for signatures to save the housing project. But because she is not underlining that activity with making a vampire army, she is seen as doing it the right way. Candyman 2 has been critiqued for the lack of class consciousness in its setup, particularly the scene where the upper middle class black folk presented as who the audience should be connecting with are talking about the legend. But I think there's also a point to be made about who is presented as sympathetic victims of specifically police violence since that's where the film ends and how Anthony may be treated better in the public eye than William. What is deemed respectable can very much be dependent on the writer's own expectations, like in Bad Hair. Given that that film is an examination of black women's relationship with their hair through the eyes of a black man, the respectable thing to do is to not buy into weaves, wigs, and alternate forms of wearing your hair. Even though as a black woman, you may recognize that wearing your hair in a specific way is seen more appropriate than others, the film argues otherwise. Respectability is not as flashy as a trait as being a doctor or a sharpshooter or a former PI, but it is what allows these characters to make it through their story to the end and if not survive because like Anthony dies to be seen as the one who is special and worthy of continuing onward in whatever way that means arguably with Anthony there's also Brianna who is not developed very well but is doing the right things and in the right places and trying to be a good person and so that's why she also gets to survive to the end anyway not trying to dive back into that just pointing out that the power instead of being a explicit physical behavior is more of like a, a way of carrying yourself and a way of emotionally reacting to things which is especially interesting with black as night because there's a whole scene where they like torture an old man but that's neither here nor there A lot of films seem to hit these same three themes as older black exploitation films, but the difference lies in how current events are being exploited, which is uncomfortable phrasing, I know, and I think that discomfort, which may fuel an unwillingness to critique certain media, is also an aspect that makes these films profitable. Because you are uncomfortable, you feel like it's saying something important, and so you're willing to watch it and to tell other people to watch it. With modern stories, we're frequently batting around this question of, is this simply jumping on a timely topic or are these genuinely stories we need and want to hear? I think writers can be moving in good faith and or a long time interest and have just now been able to produce the projects that they want to make because studios are now finding them profitable and are willing to invest. But at the same time, particularly for movies, Writers can be pushed to create what is currently grabbing a lot of attention, regardless of individual interest. So it can be, and probably often is, both capitalizing on timely content and creators writing what genuinely interests them. It's worth noting that 70s black exploitation films were independently produced because of the lack of studio support. However, removing that difficulty to get funding doesn't bump a film out of this genre. While low budget production may be a hallmark of black exploitation films of the 70s, I think the handling of content is much more central to the genre and what we see repeated today, but warped to modern sensibilities. I mentioned earlier that the heavy use of buzzwords is a very post 2016 thing to do. I like to call it the dear white people effect. In the movie, there is a scene with Sam and Dean Fairbanks that feels like someone picked up the first intro to sociology book they could find, flipped to the chapter on racism, and copy-pasted a paragraph into Final Draft. 
70s black exploitation, instead of being explanatory, created antagonists as an exploration of the depth of how vicious white supremacy can be. Foxy Brown has a chunk of the story where Foxy is almost sold into sexual slavery. There's no need for a point where she stops to explain the evils of sex trafficking. It's understood through how she's treated and what she's threatened with that this shit is awful. While not every movie needs to be as explicit as Foxy Brown, there are ways of explaining difficult or complex topics without shoehorning it into the plot. In contrast, modern media will literally lecture the viewer about why bad thing is bad. As much as this is a hallmark of the times, it's also a shift in the purpose behind exploiting current events. Theek the Signifier has a video talking about allyship in which he splices in interviews with Justin Ponder of Uplifting Impact. At one point, Ponder says something like, people come to our workshops expecting to get the tools to solve racism in an hour. People are turning to fictional media for that too, or at least the producers of media believe that they are. As a result, we get a falsified way of calming cultural anxieties by putting the power back in the hands of the viewer. Just do this thing, learn these facts, and you can put a stop to institutionalized racism. If the goal of original black exploitation was to be about and for black people, are these stories that teach the audience why oppression is bad and maybe how to combat it aimed at the marginalized communities that they are talking about? With the removal of catharsis and lavish celebration of blackness that you can find in 70s films, it makes me wonder who even is the audience of nouveau black exploitation? It's not that 70s black exploitation films did not eventually become watered down. Anything that can be monetized eventually will be stripped of meaning to become as commercialized as possible under capitalism. But the downward trajectory for nouveau black exploitation accelerated exponentially. The other thing, too, about this shift from genuine expressions to just trying to get a cash grab through typically racial trauma is that that shift also accounts for the amount of these flat formulaic films and shows that we are seeing. Earlier, I think, still editing, different day, I mentioned that a lack of support from studios is what led to previous films, previous black exploitation films being very low budget because people had to finance this on their own. I think while studios now may be more willing to produce this type of content, they still don't see much worth in it, and it's still exploitative. So you're putting in as little as possible in hopes of getting back as much as possible, both in terms of production value and in terms of content. I think people often use the term black exploitation as shorthand for saying a low budget production about black people, but the reality is more avaricious than that. Creators and studios have found a way to seem provocative. It's enough to get people to watch in a way that feels familiar. But where films from the 70s had more time to push at the status quo before becoming commercialized, the nouveau black exploitation, thought-provoking storytelling got whittled down to say almost nothing at all very quickly. And worse, what we are seeing more often now is the denouncement of critiques of oppressive systems through the establishment of pretentious and limiting standards. If you made it to the end, thank you for making it to the end. How are you, child? It's been a while. I am down bad. I'm feeling tired in the body and in the mind. Got a lot of shit to watch. Hopefully, some of my upcoming downtime will be used to be productive. Um, but I might just sit. No thoughts. Head empty. I believe this is coming out the week of the day of thanks. So if that's something that you celebrate or recognize, I hope that that was lovely, that you ate well, that you got to be around people you love, um, that you maybe donated it to some indigenous people if that is in your budget. Anyway, I'll hopefully see you all again before the end of the year. Until then, stay safe. I'll catch you in the next Echo Chamber.